So our next speaker is Greg Wood from Canisius College, coming from Buffalo. Thank you so much, Greg. Hi, thank you. We were having little technology problems earlier in the day, so I had to kind of fall back on an old-fashioned uh, solution. Um, but I, I just want to tell you right away that um, these are not, uh, these look like regular three by five cards, but they're not. They're special Twitter cards. They only hold 140 characters um, each. Anyway, my name is Greg Wood, and I uh, work at uh, Canisius College. I'm a college professor. Uh, at least that's what it says on my contract. Um, if you go to rate my professor, you'll see that I have a listing there. And uh, you can actually read some of my reviews. Some, some people actually think I'm a pretty good college professor, although you'll find some where people disagree a little bit. But you know what I wanted to share is that being a professor is an admirable vocation. vocation. Um, professors do research. They seek for truth and knowledge in their respective disciplines. They serve on library committees. The title professor comes from the Latin verb profitori, to declare publicly, to acknowledge, to profess. I've been a professor for over 25 years now, and while I admit that it's a pretty good gig, I find myself wanting more. What I really want to be is a teacher. Now, some people might tell you that being a professor and being a teacher is really the same thing, but I have to disagree. You see, in my mind, a teacher is someone who arouses your curiosity. A teacher is someone who inspires you to learn more. A teacher is someone who challenges you with tough questions. A teacher helps you to grow intellectually and morally. The Jesuits, known for their educational tradition that goes back hundreds of years, have a, a word that they use called magis. Now, literally translated, the word magis means more. But in the context of education, it means striving for excellence, daring to learn more, never settling for easy answers to simple questions. The, um, the Jesuits also have another phrase that they use to define their mission. It's, it says, creating men and women for others. And when you consider all of these aspects of teaching, it becomes clear that a teacher is someone who changes people's lives. Now, over the years, as I have explored different ways of professing and teaching, I've naturally looked at how I run my classroom. And the problem, or, and my presentation today is based on really two things that I've tried to do to become less of a professor and more of a teacher. One of those things is I've really uh, been looking into social technologies and ways of incorporating social technology into the educational process. And the other thing I've done is I've tried to find good role models, people who can be an example for me and that I can learn from. Like many others in education, I was and am intrigued by the potential for using social technologies in education. And um, you know, lots of us are using social technologies like Facebook and Twitter and wikis and blogs and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's actually a trend. It's called Education 2.0 or Classroom 2.0. And like many of my colleagues, I have a Facebook page. I, I have a Twitter stream and my students follow me and I follow them. And um, actually, one of the things that's kind of fun is that um, students forget that I'm following them and they tweet, you know, at 3 a.m. in the morning as they're stumbling home from the bar. And it's kind of a great way of, um, you know, learning about their lives outside of the classroom and helping better understanding who I'm trying to talk to. So step one, I, I have the tools, but just having the social tools isn't really enough. I I, I need to. I, I need more. I, I need to. I, I need to find ways of really reaching people, and for that, I, I look to role models. People like, oh, ancient Chinese philosopher Confucius, or Annie Sullivan, a uh, woman who helped Helen Keller and was a pioneer in the education of of handicapped people. Um, Jamie Escalante, who showed us that. Um, a good teacher is someone that can reach the 
disadvantaged and disenfranchised kids in East LA and teach them math, and not, not just any math, but like you know, serious high-level AP calculus math, stuff I can't even do, and I'm a professor. Um, literary giants like C.S. Lewis and Henry David Thoreau were known as being great teachers. And you know, I'll always be both inspired and haunted by the gift that Randy Pausch gave us when he did his last lecture. Um, if you've never seen that, I, I encourage you to go on YouTube and, and watch that. It's, it's absolutely amazing. There are people like Michael Wesch and Solomon Kahn who are pioneering uh, innovative ways of, of uh, using social media uh, to educate uh, others. But the person who's probably most associated with a teaching style that stimulates critical thinking and reasoning is that Greek philosopher Socrates. Socrates is associated with a teaching style called the dialectic, or more commonly referred to as the Socratic method. This is a style of teaching through questioning. Asking someone to sit and listen to what you have to say creates passive listeners, much like what's going on right now. Um, uh, the Socratic method is said to be most, the most powerful teaching tool for fostering critical thinking. We actually teach better by asking questions than giving answers, which leads me to my first question of the day and the title of my talk, if Socrates were alive today, what would he do with 140 characters or less, or more broadly, how would he use social technologies differently than I've been using them? How would he adapt the Socratic method to various platforms and technologies that are available today? See, when I, what I discovered is that in my own use of social technologies, I was doing quite a bit of professing, um, sharing good information, I'm, I'm sure, but not really engaging my audience, not in a way that was inspiring critical thinking. So, you know, I asked myself, how would Socrates do it differently? Well, first of all, many of his tweets would be questions, right? Um, and he would seek to challenge his followers. He'd host forums and he'd have Twitter chats framed by questions. He wouldn't care so much what his clout or cred score was. All of his retweets would come with questions like, well, witty, what is th why is this important, okay? Or how do we know this information is true? Or how does this information improve our lives? He might ask, why should we care about the information you just tweeted? Even if we tweeted questions, he might ask, are we asking the right questions? He'd ask us why we're also working so hard on developing our personal brands and on increasing the number of followers and worrying about our influence scores. He'd probably be perceived as a huge pain in the ass. Um, Socrates' dialectic or dialogue method kind of runs parallel to some early ideas of people who were looking at Web 2.0 culture. The authors of the Clue Train Manifesto tell us, markets are conversations. And so I suggest to you today that classrooms are conversations, not lectures, not exams, but conversations, questions, dialogues engaged in by people seeking truth and understanding. So going forward, one thing I'm going to start doing in my social teaching is to begin to look for ways of professing less and asking more questions. Now, today I've been watching all the speakers up here and we've seen some wonderful examples of people who I think are really good teachers, people who have engaged us, people who have asked us to think critically about things. And one person in particular who I admire uh, was just on stage a little bit, bit ago, and he doesn't know it, but you know, one of my role models is Sam Fiorello. Uh, he's a sensei, a teacher. He asks questions and encourages us 
to examine our underlying assumptions about emerging social media culture. Take a look at his sensei blogs sometime. Many of them are written uh, using questions or framed by questions like, will big data usurp big judgment? Can you be influential if you're being influenced? Can you really achieve ROI and profit using social media? I think we got the answer to that a little earlier. Um, by the way, I like Sam's style uh, pedagogically. He has a communication style that I like to refer to as professional profanity. It's, uh, it's, it's great for capturing our attention. And while he may do a bit of professing on his blogs, it's his questions that really engage us, uh, not uh, in a way that preaching would not. So let me leave we, you with a few more questions. What do we need to understand about those who we would presume to teach? What can we learn by listening to the conversations of those that we're teaching? How are we trying to influence others? And how can we tell if we're influencing others? Do we all have the potential to be teachers? Can we ask questions that expose prejudices, falsehoods, and injustice? Can we ask questions that will help people think about what's really important in their lives? And finally, how can we teach using social technologies in a way that will change people's lives? Thank you. <laughs>